play me a song. I will sing for the rest of my life. Jesus is the light, the light of the world. Come, let us celebrate Him. Lift up your voices and sing. Jesus is the light, the light of the world.
Well, hello, everyone. And let me add my uh, voice to Daryl's welcome already for this morning. It's nice to see all the faces here and for you out in virtual land. Thank you for being here. I hope the message is something that when you're done, maybe there's one or two things that you can take away to help be maybe just a slightly more positive person than you were when you came in. Um, I want to ask a question, though, before we get started. Does the world seem like it's becoming more of a negative environment, that we're getting more negative news, negative headlines, negative everything than perhaps five or 10 years ago? It's a rhetorical question. I don't expect anyone to jump out there and give me your answer. But to me, it seemed that way. And I don't like to just assume that I'm right. I like to try to get some type of support or backing. And if you look here on the screen, this um, chart that comes from Big Think, and it's referenced down in the corner, you can't see it very well, but it's from a, a 2022 study and a reference page that was done, and it's looking at um, news and news headlines, and that's what it's talking about. And I know it's hard to see, and there'll be people um, joining us virtually that are just listening and you won't be able to see it, so let me just read the heading above it as support for what I'm talking about. It says, an increase of 104% in the prevalence of headlines denoting anger since the year 2000 is apparent, the researchers reported. There are substantial increases in the prevalence of headlines denoting fear by 150%, disgust up 29%, and sadness, demo, you know, promoting sadness in the world and, and those issues, 54%. So are we living in a world that promotes negativity, that's easy for us to find, that's easy for us to, um, you know, just going out to our headline news, we can, we can see that, right? Um, so what do we do about it and why is that? Is, is there some nefarious plot out there where people are just business people and what have you, are just trying to promote the darkness, make us sad, make us depressed? Well, the answer is not really. If you look back through time, and maybe you go back five to 10 years, now there's been technology where we can track what um, people are looking at. So if you go out online and you click on a link, there's people who can track you and know what you're, you're clicking on. So if you start on a big page, and then you go down and you start clicking through those, they can see the links, they can see it. And what they've learned um, from some of those studies is that the headlines that reveal negative and emotional headlines attract more clicks than those that have positive or neutral headlines, right? So what are they doing? They're giving the people what they want. This is what we're clicking on. This is what we're opting to. Not necessarily saying you here, but the world and people in general is what they're looking for, so they're giving it to them. And what is that giving us? Well, I wrote down here, as a result, we experience stress-causing, outrage-inducing, fear-evoking media status quo, right? So we've, we've got some challenges. But what about some of the alternative news sources that are out there? National Public Radio as, as an example. So I was just curious, you know, is it really supported? So I went out to their webpage just as one to look at pulled up the first um, four headings just to see how much of it was kind of negative, sad, you know, those types of things. And if you look on here, the number one in bold, taking the biggest part of the page, University of Idaho demolishes off-campus housing where four students were killed. Next one down, five people die in an air ambulance crash in western Nevada. Go up to the top, we start talking about blizzards and floods going on, and the next one, yeah, you know, depending on how you, you spin it and look at it, is that negative or not? It's talking about the FDA finally releasing some home studies for COVID-19 and the flu, right? So at least three of the four, there are 75% of the top messages that we get when we go out there are talking about things that are, I would call on the negative side. Now, is it wrong to understand about the weather and what's coming? Absolutely not, I'm not saying that, but when you start putting it all together, what is the message? What is, what is the thought process? If our mind takes this, brings it in, runs it through our cognitive processes, what are we actually building in? Because kind of like that old expression is, you are what you eat. Well, you also are what you think and what you digest mentally and physically. Um, you know, what, what you take in, what you do, what you don't do also brings out who you are as a person. So I thought it would be interesting to look and see what the biblical perspectives are. So there are other verses out there, other books, other chapters, obviously, that you could go to. But I chose three. And again, to help those that may not be able to see this, 
It's John 16, 33. It says, in this world, you will have tribulation. So the very first part is, it's not like you might have, there could be potential. No, it says you will have. So don't freak out if something, you know, comes along and it's, it's you know, you might mark it as tribulation. Take heart, I have overcome the world. So our creator, the side that we're on, is the winning side. It's already, he's already won. We may have problems in this world, but when we look at the next world, the second coming of Christ, we're going to be in a place of perfection, right? He's already won. So what do we have to look forward to? We can make that and look at it as positive. That's why it says, take heart. I've overcome the world, right? It's a, it's a great message. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things, not some things, but all things, work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So if we are working on our calling and we are striving to serve his purpose and his goals, who's going to help us? Well, the king of the universe. And in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 was the third one that I chose. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. So I want to pause there because I have heard some people make comments and talk to different folks that seem to think that if you go through and get college education, if you learn and you grow and you develop yourself, not saying, you know, it could be trade school, it doesn't have to be a college, it could be just work experience, but if you're, you know, if you're growing in your education, somehow you're usurping God's will for you because you're doing your stuff, you're going to be learning and growing and you'll be looking at things from Perhaps your understanding. I don't believe that's what this message is saying. I don't believe that's what this verse is talking about. I don't think it's a discouragement. I think what it's really saying to us is <clears throat> when you have an understanding and God reveals something to you and they're in conflict, don't choose to follow your own understanding. Follow the Word of God. Follow the biblical principles. Follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. So don't lean on your own understanding. Don't, don't, uh, you know, if there's two options, one is God's telling us to do something or not do something, we say, eh, you know, I don't think that's such a bad thing. I'm going to do it anyway. Bad choice. We're leaning on our own understandings, right? So biblical perspectives, pretty straightforward. We're going to have tribulation. God is with us and working for us, and he will give us the understanding and the words that we need to be able to move forward in struggles and challenges that we might face and positive things we'll face. It doesn't always have to be struggles. You heard the, the scripture in Philippians. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a trim. I mean, the words sound easy, but the living up to that, wow. <laughs> Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's, that's, a, big, that's a big ask. That's huge. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, you could probably ask Penny, she could tell you that my attitude sometimes is very far away from the attitude of, of Jesus when it comes to things. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a work in progress, as they say, and I, I truly believe that I am getting better, but I still have a lot of room to grow. So we're told that the Lord is our provider. He's our sustainer, right? He will take care of us. Well, I think this also applies to our attitude. So how do we go about this? So starting back on kind of some general principles, and then I'm going to work towards six principles that I want to talk through um, as I wrap this up. But in a general standpoint, what are we talking about? Well, the Bible contains examples of the Lord Jesus Christ's life and provides instructions and commandments to his followers. So where can we go for instruction? Where can we go for guidance? Where can we go? Well, to the word. We can also go to our pastors. We can go to fellow Christians. We can go to good Christian literature and books and materials that are written that encourage us, that uplift us, right? All of those are, are sources that we, can, that we can go to. We're not um, without opportunities for places to go. And there was a slogan, and I don't know if anybody, you guys remember this, but it's been a few years ago. It used to be on posters, and I liked it. So I'm going to bring it up here. It says, attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? And you know, if we have an attitude that we really wouldn't want someone else to have that we're dealing with, maybe it is an indication that we need to be working on our attitudes a little bit because those will guide how we think and where we go. And as I said, I wanna go into six principles here in just, just a minute. 
But this I thought was, was good. Paul offers up three examples of things that are praiseworthy. And if Paul is saying they're praiseworthy, they're probably worth studying and trying to imitate, right? So I'm gonna read this again for the audience that may not be able to see it real well. I'm taking it out of the Faith Life Study Bible. It's from Philippians chapter two and it's verses five through 30. It's gonna sound a little different than a traditional Bible because it's written more like a commentary, how it's put together. But just listen to the three, the three things and maybe this week you could take one each week for the next three weeks and, and kind of study them out if you like challenges. These would be good ones. But it says here, Paul offers the Philippians three examples to imitate. First, he appeals to the ultimate example of the humility of Christ, who gave up that which was rightfully his for the sake of others, 5 through 11. This sacrifice demands that the Philippians respond to living faith, living in reverence to Christ's work, showing humility towards one another, and not grumbling. I would also say not just the Philippians, but to all of us in this room, it applies. Next, or two, Paul points to Timothy as an example of great love and selflessness, verses 19 through 24. And finally, he refers to Epaphroditus, who risked his life for the sake of Christ in verse um, 25 through 30. So we have some specific examples. We can just use chapter two, basically, as, um, as folks that you know, were told and implored to look at and to imitate, right? They're examples, they're humans, they're not perfect, but when you can see the struggles and how they responded, maybe there's some guidance in that struggle response that took place in what we see for us today. Here's something that I really like. I, I try to, to do this, it's not always easy, but I'm a simple person. If I can break things down and make it very simple, it, it works. So to me, there's two great perspectives. So when I'm talking to others, so whether it's just a friend that I'm having coffee with and we're just chit-chatting, or maybe I'm giving some constructive criticism um, to an employee or a coworker, or I'm working with you know, a Fortune 200 company and I'm talking with the CEO and I'm trying to guide them in certain things, risk management principles, whatever it might be, right? I need to remember that while I'm talking to them, that I'm not perfect, and even though I'm pointing out challenges, I need to keep that, res that, that respect and that perspective going. And am I choosing to express things as much as I can in, in an expression of love towards them, or am I doing it from a high hand and a haughty heart, right? Things that we need to ask ourselves. So when we're talking to people, we need to remember, I'm not perfect, but I love you. I'm gonna express love to you because I try to imitate the attitude and the stuff of Jesus, right? God of love. What should we do? We should be expressing love back. And in the second one, what happens when you're talking to people who aren't kind? You ever run into people who aren't kind? <laughs> yeah, not as much as you know, I might think because of what I do, but yeah, I don't. Most people are very positive and encouraging. But when you run into those that are kind of running you down, what do you do? Do you allow those, those attitudes, the words, their expressions, their thoughts um, to bring you down? Or do you remember who you really are? You're a child of God, right? So admitting right up front, someone might be saying something you can work on like, yeah, I'm not perfect, okay, let's listen to it. Let's hear what you have to say, right? Taking it from a positive perspective when you can. But remembering at the end of the day, as I said here, but Jesus thinks I'm to die for. And he did die for us and he died for you and he died for every one of us so that we have an opportunity. And if he's willing to raise us up and apprise us in a value that is so great that he'd give his own son, anything someone's gonna say that maybe we messed up or didn't quite do right isn't even worth comparison, right? We are of value and we have value. We may have to change things, but we shouldn't allow people to tear us down. And when they do, it's really hard to have a positive attitude, isn't it, All right? It's not easy, but it's, it's important. There we go. So moving on to the um, six principles I wanna share. Um, let's keep in mind the two great perspectives. I may not be perfect, but I love you as an expression to others. And when we're being chewed on a little bit, you're right, I'm not perfect, but Jesus thinks I'm to die for, right? good perspectives to have and to hold on to.
All right. The first, the first one, and then at the end, I will summarize these. If anybody's taking notes or wants to have them all together, I'll, I'll bring them all back together at the very end. But number one, think positive thoughts. Philippians 4, 8, you know, things that are true, honorable, pure, of good repute, excellence, anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Um, what is interesting, and I think I want to make sure I call out why I bolded the last four words. The word there is a, um, a directive. It's a commandment. So dwell on these things isn't one of those things where you can go, yeah, you know, it's a good suggestion. I think I'll, I'll, I'll contemplate it. No, that word is actually a directive. It is not a suggestion, and it comes from... If, you, if you're familiar with a resource, Lonida, it, it's the domains of words and where things come from. If you look it up, it's really a psychological facility. What it's saying is your mind should be full of this and it should dwell on it consistently. These are the thoughts that you should have. And then you go back up in the source and you see what they're referring to. It's truth, honorableness, pureness, rightness, love, good repute, excellence, etc. right? So when you see that, and you contemplate it, remember that dwell on these things is not a suggestion. It's just as much a commandment as the Ten Commandments are. Right? We are told to do this. So how do we go about it? So I put on here the right way. I don't want anybody to think that I'm schmug and I know the only right way to do this. This is just, in my mind, a right way that things could be applied, and I'm going to do this through all of them. So. How do we do it? Well, to me, if you choose to find the positives by choosing to replace the negative thoughts, and notice the word choosing, to replace the negative thoughts with positives and look for the half full glass, not the half empty glass, we can get there. There's many things in the creation that the good Lord gave us that are beautiful, that can bring positive thoughts and ideas, and we're all a little different. For me, one thing that I always enjoyed when I was growing up, I, I grew up in Washington State, and I lived in an area where, during the winter months, migratory fowl came in in the thousands. We might have 200, 300,000 ducks in the valley and 100,000 geese, right? And they're flying all over, and it's, it's, it's cool to see. But they fly in Vs, and I think everyone here probably knows that, but they'll fly in a V formation. And if you watch them coming in, what we used to call the northerns, right? They were coming in from the north, it was a little, it was where, where they were gonna hang out for the winter. Um, they would be in the V formations. And you see that, and they're flying along. And then if you watch long enough, every now and again, you'll see one where the front bird drops out, right? Not, doesn't fall to the ground, just drops out, and it swings back behind the other birds. Why does it do that? Well, it's tired. It needs a break, right? And why do they fly in Vs? Because it's a way of conserving energy for their long flights when they're coming in. So kind of if you think of it like a bicyclist and the, the one behind them is drafting, they got their front tire on the rear tire of the other one and they're drafting them, they're taking that extra energy, that's what they're doing. And the birds are employing you know, something that is, that's phenomenal. But where does that come from? Where does it come from? Well, that's instinct that's put into them from their creator. So if you're looking up there, you can look up and you can go, how cool is that? You know, our God even thinks about how to help the birds fly long distance, right? Cool stuff, cool stuff. Or here in Arizona, we have gorgeous sunrises and sunsets. If you can just sit out there and contemplate and see it and watch it and see the beauty that's involved with it, it's a gift. So we can choose to see half empty glasses, we can find the negative that's going on, and we can, we can talk about it and try to spread it, or we can look for the positives. website that I have used for years. It's www.goodnewsnetwork.org. It is just what it says. It's good news. It's a network of good news, but it's good, solid information that you might want to, to look at. So when you get, you know, hankering for a little bit of news or what's going on, but you don't really want to go to some of the negative sources, have yourself a few positive sources that you can go to immediately. This happens to be one. So what does this first one say? Conservative zoos, have powerful potential to reverse extinction, studies show. See that cute little young guy right there? He was dead. The doctor stayed with him for three hours doing CPR and his life came back to him. So that young man right there was dead for three hours and they brought him back. That's what that's saying is. 
You can look at letters, news, sports events, things from our galaxy, all sorts of different interesting news. Now, if you just go out and you sign up for it, you get these little clips, that's what I do, is they're just little microbursts. Or you can sign up for the whole website and there's, there's a, a sign up and a process for it, you can get it now. But have something like this, have something that's available when you want to have positive places to go. You need a little bit of recharging. Something cool like that is helpful. Number two. Look for positive messages. Isaiah 22, 14 tells us, but the Lord of hosts reveals himself to me. You mean God actually shows himself? He actually helps us? Yeah, if you're looking, you will see him revealing himself to you in many different ways. Um, some people believe that God created the world, created people, and then just went, you figure it out, and walked away, right? Um, I know of one person very, very, very dear and close to me who really honestly believes that. that. God's just apathetic. He created the world. He created us all. Put us out there and said, you guys figure it out. I'm, I'm taking off. Well, here I would argue saying the Bible tells us that no, he actually reveals himself and he shows us. So what are some of the right ways again? Not the only ways, just some right ways. Well, we need to hear from and heed what the Lord is revealing to us. What are some ways we can do that? Well, some I've already talked about. But in here today, just listening to a message that we're talking, that's a place to see how God's revealing himself. Other sermons, biblical studies, your own self-studies, sitting down with another Christian and having a cup of coffee or whatever it is you like, you know, just enjoying some time and sharing good books that are out there that are encouraging. There's all sorts of ways to do this, but we need to hear. So that's the first thing. You can't heed unless you're hearing. So you need to put yourself out to be able to do the studies and to be listening and to fellowship and do all those things so that you can hear it so that the next step is you can heed it. We must attempt to consistently apply what the Lord is revealing. That's where I'm, I'm bad at. Sometimes when new messages come along, things come through. You know, I'm great at adopting it, but then it kind of peters out and they go away, right? It's that consistency sometimes that's there. And if I choose a wrong choice and it wins out, what do we do? Do we just give up and go, yeah, I'm a loser? No, it's time to repent and move on, right? It's time to choose to change what you did and acknowledge it as something that you shouldn't have done and just move on. You can't live in the past. I love this, this came off of Google and um, I just thought it was a pretty cool way of kind of showing some different mindsets that are good to, to hold. These are things that perhaps in prayer and in our studies, we can ask God to help us see and do more, but to be you know, fully mindful. Are we mindful? Are we really using our mind? Are we thinking? How about the second one? Do we laugh often? Ask yourself, when's the last time you really had a belly laugh? I mean, where you just cracked up and your eyes were watering and you're laughing so hard you could hardly breathe, you know? It's been a while for me, I can tell you that. I can't remember the last time, but, you know, I, we, we should seek out laughter and, and, uh, and things that are uplifting. Um, seek balance. The word here is choose happiness. Yeah, happiness is a choice. Are we choosing it? And today matters. There is no disposable days. You just can't write a day off. Now, are there days where you're going to be more productive days that are, you know, that just seem to work out and things come together more for you? Absolutely. But to, you know, just to choose, you know, to, to not serve and to worship and to do all the things you, you should be doing isn't good because today does really matter. But what happens to us? Well, I think sometimes what happens to us is this, you know, the devil's been a defeated foe, but we treat him and allow him to respond to us as though he was victorious, right? He can whisper in your ear and, and you know, hey, you did it again. You think God's going to forgive you? This is the 12th time. Come on. I'm counting. This is 12. You know, <laughs> you said 11 times ago, you weren't going to do that. Now you're at 12. Eh. You know, what we need to do is metaphorically, if you will, just kind of reach up with your finger and flick him away and go, you know what? The loser here is you. You've already lost. I'm the winner. I'm a part of the winning team. And just flick them away and not to allow that and put your mind back on biblical promises. I always encourage there's little books out there that are just called that biblical promises and they're nothing more than promises. 
to have one of those in your shirt pocket, you know, purse, whatever it is, so that you can go and look at the promises, be reminded of what it is that we are promised, because if he promises it, it's a given that it's going to happen. Right? We may have to do something to engage it, but if we do and we follow, we will win. Point three, positive sights. Hebrews 12, 2, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. So, again, some right ways. Again, we shouldn't be looking at people, anyone out there, as disposable people. You know, they're just disposable. They're just, they're the, they're the trash of our society, right? Why? Because each and every one of those that you may, or someone might say that about, have God's image. They're bearers of God's image. And we need to at least hold the respect that God created them in His image, and they have opportunities as well, right? So, right ways is to see people as God sees them. And the second one is to remember that, really, what is our place? We are ambassadors. That's what we are here for. We're ambassadors to the kingdom while we live in the earth. So we have to earn money here. We have to feed. We have to take care of our family. We have to have shelter. We have to have clothes. We have to do all of those things. But what should really be driving us is the fact that we are the ambassadors. We are bringing that kingdom. We are representing that kingdom to those that see us, to those that hear us to those that ask questions of us, right? We need to move forward in service as ambassadors. Speak positive words. This one's kind of cool. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders, Psalms 105, verse two. And I would ask you, what is your elevator speech? Do you have elevator speeches? And maybe I add back up one more step further and say, do you know what an elevator speech is? Well, you may have a definition, I have a definition. Let me share what I'm referring to here. If I'm talking about an elevator speech, I'm talking about being able to give a short, concise response to questions that are asked. We can't know everything about everyone and all theology, and I'm not talking about you know, long dissertations. An elevator speech, in essence, is if you walk onto an elevator with another person and the doors close, and I don't know how many floors it is, I'm just gonna say 10 floors, and you're going up 10 floors and then the doors open again. The amount of time you have between when the doors closed and when the doors opened is the length of an elevator speech. So what if someone comes up to you, and these are rhetorical, nobody needs to answer, but if they asked you, why do you believe in God? Do you have an elevator speech, something quick that you can say why? It's not a whole long dissertation. It's not someone else's explanation why they believe it. It's for the faith that is within you, right? Can you give an expression of the faith that is within you to someone who asks in a quote unquote elevator speech? Or they know you go to church, so they might ask you, why do you go to church? Why do you go? What's the purpose of it? Couldn't you just stay home and you know, kick back and enjoy? You know? why, why do you go to church? What's the answer? Oh, I don't know, what are you gonna say? And then this one, especially for those, and if Leland was here, I'd, I think his head would be uh, nodding um, because of his, his, his love for apologetics. But what if someone came up to you and says, doesn't evil prove that God either doesn't care or doesn't exist? How would you answer that? That's a very challenging question, and I like apologetics as well. And many books always have that question somehow worded in there differently to try to give answers because that's one of the big, big things. People say, well, how can there be a God who has all power, all knowledge, all everything, and yet there's evil? Or maybe something just cool happens and you go, man, God's great, that is so cool. And someone's standing next to you going, oh yeah, why? <laughs> you know, are you gonna be ready to answer? Well, mm, biblical miracles, you know, those might be things to pull out, different things. But what I encourage, if you can, and it takes some thought and it takes practice. It's not generally something that'll just pop out there to you. But if you work on it, try to think of something that God has done for you or through you um, that shows that he is a personal God. I had ulcerative colitis when I was in my mid-20s. And for those who don't know what that is, that's an ulceration in your large intestine. But I didn't have just an ulceration in my large intestine. I had it from one end to the other and all points in between. My doc said it was one of the worst cases he'd ever seen, and that was his field of profession, right? So because I was young, they didn't want to start with surgery and have the bags and all that kind of stuff. They wanted to 
work with medicines. And they did, and I took medicines, and you know, I started recovering a little bit and feeling you know, a little bit better, but couldn't quite get over the hump. My mom, being a Christian lady, always taught us that we should go to the elders of the church and be anointed for our healings. And I believed it, so I went to the elders, got anointed for the healing. And I can't tell you now how much time passed from when that occurred to when I had another colonoscopy. But a colonoscopy is literally where the camera goes into the intestine and it's looking, right? So this isn't guess, this is, they're looking, they're seeing. And when I was done, the doctor basically said, I can't describe this in any other way other than, it was a miracle. He goes, I can't tell that you ever had an ulcer. He says, your large intestine, it looks very healthy for your age and all that. So I went from one of the worst cases he'd ever seen to he can't even tell that I had an ulceration. Where does that come from? Well, glory to God, right? Where did it come from? I, I attribute it to the anointing. Number five, perform positive deeds. Whatever you do, do your work for God rather than for men, knowing that the Lord, you will receive your reward and inheritance. It is of the Lord for whom you serve, right? So the only thing I really want to mention here is works do have value, but they're not salvational values, right? Works, works do have importance in my understanding, but it's through sanctification. Works help you to become more like God, more acting like God, more thinking like God. Or when we're in, um, after the second coming, the glorification, what is the ultimate rewards that you will get? Works play into that. But I wanna be very clear, they don't play into salvation. Salvation is a gift from God not from men, otherwise we would have something to boast about and we have nothing to boast about for salvation. But deeds do have value and we should try to apply them as much as we can. But in the right way, I think that means to be a positive spirit, be ready to lift up those that are down and witness to God as you have opportunity. I wanna underline opportunity, right? I know some people, you know, love them to death, but they would grab people, you know, lit figuratively off the street and just start, you know, telling them about the gospel message and all that. And these people are like, who are you? And stay away from me and you're weird and, and what have you, because God didn't give them that opportunity to talk to that person. They wanted to try to take it. And in essence, when we do that, in my mind, we're putting ourselves in God's place. We're saying, you know, I mean, it's for the, you know, a big heart, we wanna to try to do the right stuff. But when you try to take a megaphone and yell the message into someone's ears that doesn't wanna hear it, you're really, I think the, the, the scriptures that say, don't cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them and then come and tear on you, right? That's really what you're doing. You're throwing something of great value in front of people who are going to discard it like swine trampling them. So don't do what she's doing. Don't get the, the mega hone out. But when opportunities are there, have that, have that elevator speech that I just talked about. Have you know, some of those questions that are simple, not, not simple, but you can give a short answer to, ready, so that when the opportunities do come your way, you'll be ready for them. And the last one is seek out positive places. Psalms 122.1, uh, the ascent of David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So, you know, where's your positive places? Do you have positive places? Well, you know, faith doesn't make things easy, it makes it possible. So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of opportunities there. The building up in the top right, some might recognize it. That's the Seattle Seventh-day Baptist Church where I used to go uh, to services years ago when we lived up in Washington. So maybe it's going to church or maybe it's a, working with a people group that had the res connection that was going on down there at the time. And it's not going in there to try to convert, but it's really going in and working as a Christian, doing your work before the others to God so that they can see it. And maybe you'll get questions. Maybe there'll be opportunities that come up to witness, right? And many times it can be just a private little place where you're off on your own and it's an opportunity just to think and clear your heads. So in summary, what did I share? Well, this is pretty much what I shared. Think positive thoughts. Listen to positive messages. Seek positive sights. Speak positive words. Perform positive deeds. And attend positive places. Thank you.